man, please. Yeah. Please. I'm, I'm going to open up insurance, put two, three million in my insurance, and borrow from that and put it back in. What could you do with a million dollars from your policy? You can fund a business. You can fund and buy more real estate. You can take advantage of opportunities that might come your way. In a case in music, he might fund his next record or records, sign on his new artists from his own life insurance policy because he initially funded it with two to three million bucks, allowed it to earn a rate of return, allowed it to earn an interest rate, and through the interest he's earning through the life insurance contracts, he's able to loan it back out of the policy without paying a dime of tax and fund his next deal. Hey, hey, oh, let's do it. Oh, let's do it. Hey, let's do this conversation about what Waka Flock of Flame said about life insurance. Quote, open up insurance, put two to three million, borrow from that. What are we talking about in this episode? We're going to break down what Waka Flocka meant in that interview, what I perceive he meant in an interview, some strategery. We're going to show you game in this episode of the Seven Fear Squad. Starting in three, two, one, let's go. Psst, come on over here, let me show you something. This is all life insurance right here, life insurance. And not for my clients, although we've helped over 28,000 clients just last year in 2021, but this is all life insurance policies for who? for my family and I. Now, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm simply a licensed life insurance agent building national agencies across the United States. And I wanna break down what Waka Flocka was sharing here, some areas that a lot of people got excited about because they didn't realize that life insurance has these tax strategies and tax advantages and opportunities that a lot of people thought that was just for either the rich or for people that was going to be buried in their funeral one day. So let me just share with you a little bit of baseline, a little bit of foundation in why a lot of people get their money wrong. This is not something that you just say, okay, I'm gonna watch vid one video, I'm done with this. You need to re reach out and say, listen, I need to find some wise counselors and advisors who have been there, done that, who've been through some good times, been through some bad times, and still living to talk about it. One of the strongest structures in the history of humankind is the triangle, the pyramids of Egypt. And when you build your foundation of your home, you want to build it in an area where it's strong, no matter what happens, weather, changes in environment, this structure will stand strong, like your house, like your financial house. So at the bottom of your financial structure, when you're building your financial home, the first thing you want is certainty when it comes to income, certainty when it comes to cash flow, because no matter what happens over here with life insurance, whatever you decide to put your money into or a fancy word such as asset allocation, diversification, diversification of your financial strategies, no matter how fancy that may all sound, if you don't have the finances, the cash flow to fill it and fund it, the best plans lose. So you have to find ways to make sure you solidify your cash flow first. I served eight years in the United States Marine Corps, and I didn't learn any of this stuff until maybe my last year in. Why? Because I went through some financial challenges. I got married, divorced, filed bankruptcy, found myself in a very bad position. I found myself as a single father in custody of my kids. So you have to address this thing called risk. And usually in this conversation about risk, that's when I stumbled across how to mitigate and minimize risk, which is through life insurance. The next thing is you should build upon that is your savings for emergencies and opportunities. Next you don't have to have a debt management strategy for good debt and bad debt. And then you start talking about your investments. And then you start talking about a 401k. And then you start talking about stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, crypto, collectibles, et cetera, et cetera, gold and silver. The challenge with a lot of people though, they got their money like this. It's all turned upside down. Instead of building a solid financial foundation from the bottom up, it's from the top up where the investments are the first thing they talk about, and then real estate, and then debt, then savings, and oh, let's figure out this thing called cash flow. The sad thing about where a lot of people think about money is just finding ways to get rich quick. The best strategy is how to get rich methodically over time, so therefore it lasts. So here's what you should do. A couple things that you should consider. Number one, you should have a plan for your next moves. What's the next moves? Oh, since I got my budget together. As soon as I solidify my income, as soon as I solidify this, that, blah, 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 what's my plan? What's my next moves? Am I happy here? If I'm not happy, I need to have an exit strategy. If I'm working on plan A and plan B is not where I want to be, that then becomes then plan B. You got to find now a plan A you're transitioning into. So plan your next move. Number two, you need persistency, commitment, urgency. You need to surround yourself with wise counselors and advisors. You're not surrounding yourself with people that are just not YouTube gurus or YouTube 
channels like myself. Like if you're seeing this video and you don't know who I am, please don't rest upon this video to help you make your decision with your finances or in this case, your insurance. Please take this video, read these books, watch many other videos to fill up your mind to help you create an educated and well-informed decision. What most do, however, is they fill their life with impatience, with desperation, get rich quick, tougher opportunities, they're lazy, don't really wanna work it, so therefore they wing it and uh, they only teach themselves, they're self-taught. Listen, I get self-taught, but if you wanna learn a very important topic, such as life insurance strategies, such as planning your financial future, is a very important thing that you surround yourself with a lot of people that have been there and done that, versus you just trying to figure out as you go along, because a lot of these folks who have been there, done that, the perspective they can give you is time and experience, which you do not have yet. So here's what you should do, here's what most do, and what most people think about life insurance. Oh, it's only for older people. Oh, it's only later in life. Oh, it's too expensive, I can't afford it. Oh, it's unnecessary when I'm single. Oh, I got insurance rate, I got it at my job. Listen, this is not what we're talking about. This is not your granddaddy's policy. This is not a group policy. This is not your job's policy. This is an individual life insurance policy and strategy that we're discussing here. Oftentimes people think, okay, let me just get the typical term insurance policy. Okay. Term insurance policy. Let me explain. Let me go further. So sometimes people, go, there's, there's two ends of the spectrum here. Okay. There's two ends of the spectrum. People can say, you know what? I'm going to minimum fund my financial strategy, my insurance strategy. And this is what usually term insurance is all about. So the term insurance says, let me get the least amount of cost for the biggest amount of death benefit. That's my style of life insurance. But the challenge with this term is that you have to have a demise of yourself in that term. You put $50 a month into this thing for a 30 year insurance policy for a 30 year period. So $50 a month policy every month for 30 years for a 30 year period in exchange from day one, the moment you put 50 bucks into this policy from day one is something, Lord forbid, were to happen to you a $500,000 death benefit in this example would be paid to your beneficiaries. And that's where most people think that life insurance is all about. What Waka Flocka is talking about here, right? He says, open up insurance, put two to three million and borrow from that. Man, please. Yeah. Please. I'm, I'm going to open up insurance, put two, three million in my insurance and borrow from that and put it back in. Well, I'll break it down even further because the, the other side of the spectrum is actually what he's talking about where you maximum fund a life insurance contract with as much cash as you can contribute to it, okay? Based on the availability and the insurability of your life. And what also, the, we'll talk about some tax guidelines here of what you can shove into a life insurance policy by maximum funding it. You want to have the minimum life insurance afforded to you by the IRS tax code that you can shove all this cash in and still qualify under the definition of it actually still being a life insurance contract by minimum death benefit and maximum funds inside the policy by stuffing a lot of cash inside this particular life insurance contract. So what motivated this video is that we published this video with my reaction to what Waka Flocka said about financial literacy and what he said also about life insurance. He said, open up insurance, put two to three million in it and borrow from that. What Waka Flocka said with two to three million bucks, you can break this down to Two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars from your gains in real estate to twenty to thirty thousand dollars that you may get from a bonus or just saving your money over a period of time, or ten to twelve, thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars that you say, you know what, I got some money here, I want to save and and possibly have a gain for my future. How do I do that with a life insurance contract? And I share share with you. There's many different ways to do with it. What Waka Flocka is talking about is permanent life insurance. Okay. Over here, we we're talking about term insurance, where it's the least amount of cost for the most amount of death benefit. A different mindset comes to you looking at life insurance from a financial strategy to accumulate wealth and to be able to draw from it without paying a dime in tax. By the way, he didn't even mention that in this video. He didn't talk about paying, not paying a dime in tax. So you can accumulate this money inside properly structured maximum funded life insurance contracts and withdraw it or loan from it without paying a dime in tax. And what permanent life insurance structures, basically what he's talking about is permanent life. And there's, that's a style of life insurance. There's one style, which is term insurance, which I explained before. And the other style is permanent life insurance, where it talks about 
stuff and cash inside it. And what are some of those characteristics of permanent life insurance contracts? There's whole life policies, there's universal life policies, there's variable life policies, and then there's index universal life policies. I dare to think that he may not be talking about the variable life policy because this is one of the four that is not guaranteed. It's tied directly to the ups and downs of the stock market and the least appropriate life insurance policy for this strategy. So for purposes of this video, I'm just going to X this out of this conversation, assume that he's not using variable life insurance policies. Again, one of the most risky policies out there in the marketplace. And oftentimes people who have not gotten advanced training on life insurance, who still have trained from the 60s, 70s and 80s, think that permanent life insurance policy is all but one policy, which is called whole life. Watch, you'll see even in the comment section below, people talking about whole life, whole life, whole life, whole life, whole life, thinking that that's the only style of policy with inside permanent life. There's whole life, and then there's, in 1980 was created, universal life, and then in 1996 was created, index universal life. So this, there's three different iterations of life insurance that fits the potential strategy when somebody says, I want to put money inside a strategy to accumulate wealth, not pay a dime in tax as it's growing, and then withdraw that wealth without paying a dime in tax legally and ethically according to the IRS tax code. So what Waka Flock is talking about is maximum funding life insurance. Maximum funding permanent life insurance contracts. And there's a little bit of history behind this. So what happened in 1982, a tax code was passed called TEFRA, Tax and Fiscal Reconciliation Act of 1982, which basically created guidelines for life insurance to qualify as a certain definition of life insurance if you have lots of cash inside these life insurance contracts. So then they defined what a modified endowment contract meant, which means that any money that's inside a life insurance policy can still be transitioned to the beneficiary upon the demise of the owner without paying a diamond tax under IRS code 101A, okay? So if you die with a life insurance policy, any money that you have with that life insurance company will transfer to your beneficiaries without paying a dime of tax. So it included not only the death benefit, but also the cash value. Now, let's say you had uh, $100,000 inside a life insurance policy and it was a modified endowment contract. Waka Flocka cannot put two to $3 million inside a life insurance contract and enjoy its tax benefits if he wants income tax withdrawals down the road. So if he just shoves two to $3 million into a life insurance policy from day one, then it will automatically turn into a modified endowment contract and thus he cannot withdraw money since he's under 59 and a half years old without paying any penalties or income taxes. Because under modified endowment contract laws, if you take money outside a modified endowment contract, which is a life insurance policy, then now losses tax advantages, you have to pay a 10% penalty, just like an IRA or a 401k, and income taxes on the gains that you have inside the life insurance policy if now your life insurance policy is deemed as a modified endowment contract. So people didn't like that. So next thing you know, DEFRA was passed in 1984. Deficit Reduction Act in 1984. And then in 1988, TAMRA, Tax and Miscellaneous Revenue Act, was created in 1988, which said, okay, if you want money inside these insurance contracts, you have to pay what they call, you have to follow a corridor called the seven pay or the MEC guidelines to have money inside life insurance in a tax advantage way. Meaning that if you're under 50 years old, which Waka Flocka is, he can basically shove two to $3 million inside a policy in a three installment period time frame. Or if he's over, if somebody's over 50 years old, over four installments, three years in one day or four years in one day, installments into a life insurance contract. Now, with that being said, if that's what he was doing, if uh, I'm not his financial advisor, his business manager, or his insurance agent, I'm just presuming what he said, I'm just trying to break down what we've done for clients that fit this type of profile, that you filter this money in. So let's say you have, in this example, let's say you have 3 million bucks. Now you're filtering in $600,000 over a three year period or a four year period. You got 600 grand basically going inside a policy. So I kind of put together what you would see on an insurance ledger, okay? So if you're working with an insurance agent and they understand these strategies, then they will know how to create an illustration for you that fits the guidelines of 1984, 82, 82, 84, and 88. Tefra, DEFRA, and TAMRA, and avoid a modified endowment contract scenario where you are taxed later on 
if you want to withdraw this money for income or investment purposes to invest in other things or to live on, you don't want that. But if you want to make sure you have tax advantage guidelines down the road, you have the opportunity to do that. So this is a ledger, okay? This is a, a, a sample of a ledger from a properly trained life insurance agent that understands these strategies, but this is generally speaking a ledger you would see inside a life insurance policy. Because traditionally, what a lot of people think, 401k, okay, I'm saving for my retirement. So let me break this down right quick. These are different retirement plans that all come from the Internal Revenue Code. See, these retirement plans, when people say, I've got a job, I got benefits, and a 401k, well, it's IRS 401 Chapter K. You're usually working for a for-profit corporation. If uh, you're working for a nonprofit corporation, a, 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 a CDA hospital, or, or a school, you most likely will have a 403B. If you work for the city, a municipality, you usually will have a deferred compensation or what they call a 457 retirement plan. You work for the federal government, so you usually call a TSP, a, a thrift savings plan, or you're working for the unions, you have a pension, okay? So all come from where? The Internal Revenue Code. So these companies and or the individuals you can put your money here and have significant tax advantages. But insurance falls not under 401k, 403b, 457, TSP pension. IRS falls under, again, IRS code 7702. IRS code 7702 of the Internal Revenue Code. So your life insurance agent should be familiar with these strategies. Obviously, Walker Flocker is an insurance agent that properly educated him, made him aware, say, hey man, compared to anything that you can put your money into to grow, and compound and to protect yourself from losses in the economy, losses in the stock. By the way, whole life, if the stock market crashes, if interest rates go high as, as they're doing right now, and the economy has a massive crash, guess what a whole life policy will still promise to pay a policyholder? The dividends it promised to pay. The interest rates that the universal life will pay. Same thing here with the index universal life policy, the tracking of the S&P 500 or the Hang Seng index or the Russell 2000 index, whatever index, whatever indices, that an index universal life policy will track. It will make sure it, it records the gains, but none of the losses. That's why a lot of people love these strategies for, love these particular um, policies for the strategy because these three policies, not the variable life, will remove you from exposure to stock market and economic losses. So when you're looking at IRS code 7702, what you're combining is, how do I get access to my money in a short period of time before I'm 59 and a half years old? How do I make sure my money is safe? How do I make sure that my money has a decent rate of return? And number four, my money has significant tax advantages. We call this the laser test, LSRT. So anybody asks you, hey man, you should put your money away. Put your money away here, put your money away there, put your money, yeah, does it pass my laser test? And by the way, there's a video right here. We call that the four homes of money, okay? So watch this video here. If anybody ever tells you to put your money somewhere, you now have a system by watching this video to help you make educated and aware choices of what to do with your money. Again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just educating you on some of the questions you need to ask yourself to process this so you have a formula to make better educated decisions. Okay, so back to the ledger. As an example, you're gonna have one column here and a second column here and a third column here. One column is gonna say guaranteed column. Second one is most likely non-guaranteed column. The third column is your death benefit column, okay? Different insurance companies illustrated differently, but this is generally what they would show inside and Illustration. So in this example, we got $3 million coming to a policy where $600,000 a year, $600,000 a year, $600,000 a year, $600,000 a year is in this example, okay? And then for the rest of the policy years, the rest of the life of the policy, I'm presuming Waka Flag would put zero into the policy. In this example, he's putting away $3 million in a five-year period, okay? He's putting 600 grand over a five-year period in this example. Now, in a guaranteed column, the insurance company is gonna say, okay, this is the most amount of money we can charge you for cost of insurance. And this is what's gonna happen when we, don't not, we do not credit you the highest amount of interest. The, the minimum we can credit you on the policy, contractually speaking, inside these contracts, this is what your money's gonna look like. The non-guarantee says, well, this is what we're gonna charge you based on current costs of insurance, not maximum cost of insurance, that is in guaranteed column. But two, we're gonna, in, in column two, it says, this is gonna be the current charge we have with cost of life insurance based on your age and your gender and your, your health rating, whether you're standard uh, uh, non-tobacco rating or preferred elite uh, rating means you're the healthiest, so therefore your cost of insurance is the lowest. But this is based on, this is the cash value what's gonna look like as an example. By the way, don't hold me to these numbers. These are just general ballpark numbers of what you should see inside a life insurance contract if this is something you wanna do. 
but there's guaranteed and non-guaranteed based on current interest rates the policy is crediting, based on current projections if it's an index universal life that is, is going to project. And by the way, there's specific rules now inside index universal life contracts based on certain ta based on certain regulations that were passed to make sure your insurance agent is not over selling and over inflating what they can illustrate inside the cash value accumulation side of life insurance policy. So you make sure your insurance agent knows about that law. If they don't know the law, then that agent isn't trained in this in the strategy. They should know. And probably I'm doing the homework for the insurance agent watch, watching this because listen, I know my competitors watch this as well. So I, I, listen, I don't care if my competitors watch this. I want to help the industry. I want to help people out there with the finance. I want to help our industry increase its game so therefore it can serve and help more people. Because the challenge today is that in terms of life insurance, the challenge today is not that people don't have the right type of life insurance. That's not the challenge we have today. The challenge we have today is people don't have any insurance, period. Okay, that's the biggest challenge we have. The, the, the massive amount of uninsured people and they gotta rely on GoFundMes and all that type of stuff which is never supposed to be created for emergency and or death benefit purposes. But back to this, let me get off my soapbox. Based on this column now, as this money grows and accumulates, because there's a couple phases, there's a contribution phase, and then there's accumulation phase, right? And now there's a distribution phase. And another phase we'll talk about later on, which is transfer phases, which is why my wife and I have wills and trusts, and we sat down with an attorney to create, make sure all of our assets and, 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 and life insurance and everything that we own goes into a trust, okay? We sat down with our attorney, we got it all drafted up to make sure we uh, become tomorrow's old money. How many of you guys want to become tomorrow's old money? Amen? Put it in the comment section below. I am tomorrow's old money. Put it in the comment section below if you believe that is you. Okay, so you put your money, so you, uh, Waka Flock is putting money in, okay? This is you. It doesn't have to be 600 grand, it doesn't have to be two, three, two, three million bucks. It could be two, three hundred thousand dollars. It could be 20 to 30 thousand dollars. It could be five, 10, 15 thousand. Whatever, it's all relative to you and what you want and what you're looking to accomplish. But I'm just, Taking it from his scenario, I presume that this is usually the strategy what's happening. He's putting $600,000 for five years into his policy, and the ledger will show a guaranteed, non-guaranteed comp based on current interest rates, current interest rates and guaranteed interest rates inside the policy. And based on that amount of money, he'll qualify for a certain amount of death benefit. Now, I have zero clue what the death benefit is for Waka Flocka. I'm not sure exactly how old he is, what type of health he has, and which type of death benefit he qualified for. A typical example would be, he, he's, if he's putting two to three million dollars in here, and he's probably most likely, what, he's in his 30s? Somewhere around those lines, probably in his 30s? Mid 30s like mid 30s, he most likely qualify for a healthy death benefit. So if he puts two to three million dollars into a policy, he'll qualify for a, and he could qualify for the policy, the death benefit is gonna be in a 10 million dollar policy. Now, the knock on this, a lot of people say, hey Matt, you know, the challenge I've heard online is that when somebody passes away, beneficiary receives the death benefit, but none of the cash. That's true under option A. But if, if you are an insurance agent, ask, if you're working with, together with your insurance agent that knows this stuff, ask them for option B, or what they call an increasing death benefit, because the policy is also gonna include not only the death benefit, but also the cash that's inside the policy. So if something were to happen to Waka Flocka, and he's cho he chose option B on his insurance policy. He'll not only receive, in this example, a $10 million death benefit, but let's say he's got $600,000 inside the policy. He's also gonna see whatever cash value that's also inside the policy, so it's a combined benefit. So this is how you accumulate money inside a life insurance policy. We're gonna put money in over a three, four, five year period. You're gonna have a guaranteed column, you're gonna have a non-guaranteed column, and you're gonna have your death benefit. So, all this money grows. Let's say uh, Waka Flocka's money grows here to 12 million bucks. Okay? Now, the thing here, notice is all the way down here. Because money that you put inside a policy, his borrow from that, what he didn't say in that video was when. When? Now, I'm not so sure if he's going to borrow in the first year, or second year, or third year. Not advised to do that. Because you want to treat a life insurance policy like a bank or a checking account. You want to have what they call a capitalization phase. You want to capitalize your life insurance policy so therefore it can finally get inside the policy and start earning a rate of return. So therefore it can grow and start compounding. What you also have to look at is the insurance companies also have cash surrender values that's inside the policy. In other words, for a period of time and declining over a period of time, for the first 10 to 15 years with most life insurance contracts, they will not allow you to touch all of your money all at the same time, especially at the beginning. 
So the surrender charges, a lot of people say, well, you know, life insurance has a lot of charges. A lot of times in life insurance, those charges only apply if you surrender the policy, which is something you should not do when you set up this type of strategy. In other words, if you set up the strategy, you should have the mindset to die with this policy in force. That you're not here to set up the policy and then pull the money out and then close it like you treat it like a credit card or a bank account. And yes, and you have to ask yourself why. Why is such great tax provisions with inside the life insurance industry? Well, how come the 401k don't have this? How come a 403b? How come cryptocurrency don't have this? How come real estate don't even have this? But think about the good, the social good that life insurance does for the community. And you have to look at tax codes. You gotta look at tax codes and say, what is the incentive? Uncle Sam, what are you trying to get me to do? So for example, in society, if there's an entrepreneur that's taking him on the most risk, he's putting all his money on, he's putting his credit on the line, time and effort and energy to create jobs, to create products and services that the government could not do, guess what the government in return exchanges to the entrepreneur? Well, if you're gonna take on all that risk, we're gonna give you certain tax provisions. The government says, listen, if you take care of yourself, if you financially take care of yourself, if you buy a life insurance policy and then under IRS code 101A, all this money here, this death benefit, you don't have to pay a dime in tax. Why? Because you took care of yourself. And if you take care of yourself as a private citizen, you're not gonna be sitting in my line for Section 8. You're not sitting in my line at Social Security. You're not sitting in my line for other government benefits, island card or, or, or food stamps, et cetera, et cetera. You're not dependent, bottom line, on the bottom line because you as a citizen took care of yourself and you took care of your family. That's why we now we allow you certain tax provisions to take advantage of if you as a citizen do so. So if you are educated about what life insurance can do, forget these, this fancy strategy here, think about this. Do you want to leave your family a financial inheritance? Do you want to leave the people that you love and care about a financial head start much greater than when you had when you were coming up? Do you? Well, that's what life insurance does. So back to the strategy. Now this is all set up, right? Walker Flock has got two to three million dollars into this thing. He's funneling it over a four or five year period. He's in alignment with the tax guidelines of Tefra, Defra, and Tamra. Now this policy is deemed tax advantaged. He either has indexed universal life policy, universal life or whole life policy. Okay, now he's got 12, let's say for example, he's got 12 million dollars into this thing. Woo, okay. If you had this money inside a brokerage account, what are you paying every year? And it's not inside an IRA or what they call a qualified plan. You have to pay tax. Every time you make money inside your brokerage account, you buy and sell stock, capital gain, offset by the capital losses, you have to pay now taxes. You have $20 million inside there, inside a 401k or a 403b, you deferred taxes your entire life, now you gotta pull this money out, guess what you gotta pay now? This $12 million was inside these different tax structures. You have to pay tax. Well, guess what tax strategy allows you to grow your money tax-free, to accumulate your money tax-free, and withdraw your money without paying a dime in tax. And then something happens to you, the money blossoms in value to your next generation without paying a dime in tax. Well, guess what? That falls under IRS code 7702. Who lives inside IRS 7702? The life insurance industry. What a great industry, right? So here in this scenario, now, if you got 12 million bucks, how do I get my money? Show me the money. Okay, great, now let me get my money. Here are three ways to get money out of your life insurance policy. One, sad way. Two, dumb way. Three, smart way. Let's go with sad. Now, if something happens to Waka Flocka, sadly, anybody, something happens to a policy holder with an enforce contract, sadly, when they pass away, they will receive the death benefit. In this example, a $15 million death benefit. So sadly, to get money out of the policy, somebody sadly has to pass away. Somebody has to die, which is a traditional way of where life, people thought life insurance policy was all about. Now, here's another thing, another sad way, but not so sad, especially if you're going through it. Let's say you had a heart attack, stroke, cancer, or you're older in age, you can't take care of yourself, you need some home health care, or you got injured on the job, and you can't take care of yourself, you need somebody to help you around. We can qualify for a critical illness benefit if the properly structured life insurance policy has living benefit provisions in it. It's part of the, by, by the way, there's not a lot of life insurance co companies that offer it or have it, just so you guys know. 
Uh, or one ways you can get your money from the policy is if you are deemed terminally ill. But again, that is a sad way to get money from a life insurance policy. But it is a way to get money from a life insurance policy. The second way is a dumb way, okay? Which is to withdraw. Okay, I got $12 million in it. Let me withdraw my money. That is a dumb way. Why is that a dumb money? Because a couple of things here happen. FIFO means first in, first out, okay? So your principal is taken out of the policy and then your interest. Okay, and so what happens is if you pull this money out via a withdrawal, you permanently reduce the cash value and death benefit within inside the policy, and to be able to put that back in via uh, after a withdrawal is very difficult because you permanently then reduce the cash value and death benefit by creating a withdrawal. Now you can take money out from your policy as a withdrawal, but is the dumb way to do it. The other way. It's not the smart way. It's basically a loan from the policy. People say, well, why I got a loan from my life insurance policy? It's my money, right? Well, it's funny how people have that knee-jerk reaction when they do the same thing with real estate all the time. Oh, Matt, you know, I, got, uh, I bought this house at $100,000. Now it's worth $500,000. I got $400,000 equity. Well, how do you get it out? Well, I can sell the house, get the $400,000, or I can stay in the house and do a cash-out withdrawal, cash-out refinance, excuse me, and strategically refinance the house and take out the equity inside the house, even though my mortgage payment goes up, but now I have control of the equity. Ha ha, now I can go invest into more real estate. People don't think it's a knee-jerk reaction to loan to get equity out of the house to buy real estate, but they think it's weird that you loan from a life insurance policy. With well, the nomenclature of loan for a life insurance contract helps you strategically because money that is loaned from a life insurance policy is not deemed as either earned, passive, or portfolio income, therefore non-taxable because you don't get taxed on money you get from a loan. So when you loan money from a policy, let's say you wanna take, in this situation, a million dollars from a $12 million cash value accumulation with inside a policy. The dumb way is to withdraw a million bucks, okay? Because dollar per dollar, you lose cash value and death benefit from the policy day one, okay? You lose a million dollars. Or you can loan it from the policy. And here's what happens, here's a cool thing about the smart way of loaning money from a life insurance policy. Unlike money that you might have in a brokerage account, money that you might have inside a 401k, money that you might have inside a 403b or 457 plan. When you loan from those type of scenarios, those type of tax structures, the company actually has to sell your position in the stock market that day. So that's why they tell you, at the close of business, we'll sell your stock and then we'll send you a check, okay? So what happens is whatever your value or whether the stock market value of your portfolio was it that day, they have to sell in this case, a million dollars of stock, okay? So you lose your position in the market. So you lost some, up, uh, some gains and some advantage you had with dollar cost averaging. Basically, you have to sell your positions in the stock market in your 401k or 403b plan, your brokerage account, to get the million dollars out, okay? And in, in those plans also, too, you have to pay them back. Otherwise, otherwise, it becomes a taxable distribution if you don't pay back your 401k loan, you won't pay back your retirement plan on these things. Now, here inside the loan, in an insurance policy, you do not have to pay it back. So what the insurance company does, they set aside a million dollars, okay? They don't sell your position in the market. They allow you to loan a million dollar loan and then you collateralize the cash value you have inside the policy without selling your position. In this case, if you're talking about an index universal life policy, they don't sell your position inside the index of the gains or the loss of the stock market. They don't sell your position wherever you're at at that particular point inside the stock market. Which, by the way, an index universal life is not a security, which means it's not a typical stock bond or mutual fund. You're, loan, you're doing this through the transactions of the insurance company, and this million dollars is basically collateralized through your death, which will be payable through your death benefit upon your passing. In the meantime, the insurance company charges you 4% for the loan. So in this case, they're charging you 40 grand. But since they collateralized your million dollars, payable back by the death benefit, your million dollars is actually still growing in, in cash value. So it's also being credited 4%. And so one of the things that insurance companies do then, they have this provision called the zero cost wash loan. So to just let you know, what could you do with the million dollar from your policy? You can fund a business. You can fund and buy more real estate. You can take advantage of opportunities that might come your way. In a case in music, he might fund his next record or records, sign on his new artists through getting a loan from his own life insurance policy because he initially funded it with two to three million bucks 
allowed it to earn a rate of return, allowed it to earn an interest rate, and through the interest he's earning through the life insurance contracts, he's able to loan it back out of the policy without paying a dime in tax and fund his next deal or opportunities. So there, there's some sexy things that is happening, and I'll tell you this. I don't know what's going to happen in our country in the next three, four, five years. All I know is most likely going to be scary and very rocky. And for those that take advantage of what they have today, I don't know if you have a lot of money inside your savings. I don't know if you have a lot of money inside the equity of your home. I don't know if you have a lot of money sitting on the side somewhere not doing anything. But these are some of the things that you need to consider thinking about after watching the video. Again, it may not be me. All good. But talk to somebody. Surround yourself with wise counselors and advisors to help you understand what your advantages are in an industry where a lot of people thought it was just for dying. There is the word life in the word life insurance, and therefore you should take advantage of it when you are alive. Young and healthy, take advantage of this if you can, if it's suitable and appropriate for you. And for a lot of people, it's not. So when you're looking at this, uh, this is not a get rich quick strategy overnight. Please don't treat this like a bank account or a credit union account or a credit card, this does take some time to ramp up. Some fancy words, a lot of people call this strategy, they call this infinite banking, okay? Um, you know, missed fortune, right? You know, uh, max funded, uh, uh, be your own bank, right? There, there's all sorts of different marketing terms to talk about what this does. But basically, when you see those kind of buzzwords in the insurance industry, this generally speaking, this is what they're talking about. So. I've been doing this now for 23 years. I've been specifically trained this stuff since 2005. It's something we've done across the country for clients over and over and over and over again. And um, one of my favorite clients is my mom. You know, we always say in the financial services world, don't ever put your client's money into something that you wouldn't trust your own mother's money into. So again, these are my life insurance policies. That's not for my clients. This is our family. It's my children. It's for my wife and I. We got multiple policies because we have multiple needs and multiple time frames that we want to use those policies. Matt, why all the different life insurance policies? Because I started off these life insurance policies when I was broke. Some of you guys think that you need to be rich to start this. I started this when I had only 150 bucks a month to tuck away. And then I started making more money in 250. And I started making more money in 350. I started taking more money when, and it became 750. I started making more money and it became 1,000 a month. and became 2,000 a month. And I needed to get another policy because I bought a house. And my responsibilities changed. I had one kid, two kids, three kids. I get another policy because I started filling up I started filling up these policies because I was going to start conflicting with the Tefra, 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 Tefra guidelines of overfunding a policy, and that's why I needed to get another policy, um, or some of the policies have actually just increased my death benefit, and some of that's starting from scratch all over again. But uh, these are some of the things that I hope that you start thinking about when it comes to this beautiful world of financial literacy, awareness, and implementation to get you to where you want to go. Again. Make sure cash flow is established because this is nothing if you don't have consistent cash flow and security of your income. Because this right here can implode if you end up spending down your money too soon, too fast. So that's the danger of this too as well. If you end up spending this money too soon and you don't completely fund it all together with the, what you thought it'd be, it's not suitable and appropriate for you. So with that being said, guys, uh, check out these two other videos right here of me having conversations with insurance gurus in the insurance industry. Uh, I've always loved taking what the rich and the wealthy have done for generations and generations and filtering it down to the multicultural middle class. Big passion of mine and the reason why I lead a national life insurance organization because we want to establish this in America. Establish a solid financial foundation. I've been doing this now for 23 years and a problem I saw back then is still not even closely to being solved. Actually, it got worse. So that being said, guys, I'd love to know your thoughts, your questions. If you put it in the comment section below. If you think that this video has provided a little bit of value to you, please consider hitting like. If you watched a couple of our videos, and if you've done so already, you have not done so already, please consider hitting subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. From Dallas, Texas, I'm your money smart guy, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to live smart, and be money smart today.